aperture. Welcome. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Uh, my name is Emily Stewart. Uh, I am the manager of education and engagement programs here at Aperture Foundation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, curators, writers as a common ground for photography. Aperture today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by Tim Davis, and Sarah Bega show to celebrate the launch of Tim's latest Aperture book, I'm Looking Through You. Uh, Tim states, the camera is a machine that sees only surfaces. The world casts its spell and the camera gobbles up its glamor uncritically with pure certainty, assuming there is nothing underneath. I'm Looking Through You is an expansive visual poem celebrating the glamorous surface of Los Angeles and its reach, animating Tim's wry observations and the mesmerizing color pop geometry of his images is a photographer and writer's decade-long gimlet-eyed meditation on making pictures. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce you all to tonight's distinguished speakers. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Sarah Bega Show. Sarah is a writer and independent curator who's been traveling since last, last March. Her recent curatorial projects include an exhibition on how we view documentary photography seen through the work of Bruce Davidson, and a survey of photography by Robert Cumming. She is the author of the, Robert, of the book, Robert Cumming, The Difficulties of Nonsense. And her writing has appeared in Aperture Magazine, Hyperallergic, The Photo Eye Blog, and The Photo Book Review, among other publication, publications and artist books and catalogs. Tim Davis lives and works in Tivoli, New York. He received a BA from Bard College where he currently teaches and an MFA from Yale University. He has presented solo exhibitions at the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art in SUNY New Paltz, New York, White Cube in London, Knoxville Museum of Art, of Art in Tennessee, and the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College, Chicago. Several monographs have been published of his work, including The New Antiquity and My Life in Politics, which Aperture published in 2006. He is the recipient of a 2007-2008 Joseph H. Hasman Rome Prize and 2005 Leopold Godowski Jr. Color Photography Award. Um, the beautiful book that Tim has put out, I'm Looking Through You, has been made possible in part thanks to generous support from the Fred and Laura Bidwell Foundation and from individuals including Peter Barber, Andrew Lewin, Joe Bio and Ann Griffin, David Solo, Lorraine Nobloch, Frank Arisman, and Peter Cohen. Lots of support. Uh, if you haven't already done so, um, you can purchase your copy of I'm Looking Through You. Um, in just a moment, there will be a link in the chat. Plus, if you live in New York or Los Angeles, we'll be hosting in-person book signings with Tim in the upcoming weeks. Um, I'll also post info about that in the chat. Uh, please be sure to put any questions you have for Tim or Sarah in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll get to them during the event. Uh, now, I'd like to hand it over to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. And it's so great to be here and to have um, gotten to know Tim a little better from the fact that I've, I've known his work for over a decade now and just absolutely fell in love with it for its comedy and its sort of poignant storytelling. And um, this book came to me at a time when I, you know, I, as, as Emily said, I've been traveling for over a year. Um, I lived in Los Angeles for 20 years. And um, so getting it in the mail was kind of like this, this kind of cruel enticement to come back to Los Angeles. And I'm actually in Los Angeles now. So it was, it's sort of fortuitous that I'm, I can, uh, I can speak about, speak to Tim while I'm here. But um, He's going to do most of the speaking. He's got a beautiful show and he's going to show us what the book is all about. So I will, I'll just turn it over to him and we'll do a little talking later, but mostly you're going to see what this project is all about. Thanks, Sarah uh, and Emily and everyone at Aperture for making this possible and everyone out there who decided to um, spend this scorching evening um, inside around a uh, their computer, hopefully with an air conditioner. I turned mine off so you'd be able to hear me better. Um, so uh, yeah, so we're here. This book is finally out. 
Um, we've been talking about it a long time. I've been talking about it for a long time. It's been a long time in the making. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and of everything I've ever done in my life, I think this thing is the, has come out better than than any other thing. It's got a stain on it here. Um, this copy has a stain on it. Uh, don't use it as a coaster is the first thing I'm going to say. Um, and it, I'm just, it, you know, I couldn't be more grateful to Aperture, who did publish my book in 2006 of My Life in Politics. And the team that made that book um, of Leslie Martin and Andrew Sloat were reunited to the making of this book. And um, it's just uh, an incredible working partnership. This book took a long time to make. Um, and it started out with me doing lots of things I, I've never done before, including posting pictures on on this website that called Instagram that I kind of despised. And I just started doing it. And that's when Leslie sort of said, what is this work you're doing? And that led to there being a book. And that led to three years of, of kind of working it out. And normally I find when things take a long time and there's lots of voices and complications, they don't, things don't usually turn out right. But um, in this case, that kind of, I think we've all learned how to slow down um, and take a year off, say. Um, and in this case, I just think it kind of led to this ideal situation. So I'm going to share my screen and kind of talk you through just a basic um, trajectory of how I got to making this work, then start to talk about the work. And at some point, Sarah will come in and start to um, try to divert me. Which yeah. I is a thing that I need diversion. I'll, I have, yeah, I have a few questions. Plus, certain uh, images are so, so uh, I want to talk about too, but yeah. Yeah, so we'll make sure we have time for that and for your questions. Um, oh, wait, so did I make sure I, I'm going to share a little tiny bit of sound on this. I want to make sure that I click that little button that says share sound. Have you noticed how much of our lives have become tech support? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, it needs to do something. There's way more bells and whistles on Zoom all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, John Pilson, the artist, once made a great video of, of a woman do, giving tech support while she's kind of changing her clothes to go out. And it's kind of like a combination of pornography and tech support where she's going like, okay, go to file, go down the thing, but she's sort of undressing and dressing again. It's kind of a genius thing. And, well, I think it's John Pilson, okay. One, one of my favorite artists, but anyway. Okay. Nice. So I am a photographer. Um, you probably are too, but um, I've been one for a long time. My dad had a dark room, you know, uh, in our kitchen and uh, it's just a thing that was natural for me to do. And from a very early age, I, I, I understood on the one hand, the idea of the photo expedition of just what it means as, as a function in one's life to decide to go out and wander around and take pictures. That was always from the very early age, maybe seven or eight, a thing that I just did for recreation. Um, I wandered around and took pictures of things um, in a very natural way. And, um, you know, once uh, here, here's a picture I took in high school. Um, of a girl, uh, you know, and, and lots of the elements of where I'll end up are here, right? It's sort of like an urban environment. There's a person in there, there's language and signage and maybe a little bit of kind of like a little bit of sincerity and a little bit of irony and a little kind of mm, kind of black and white cookie. Um, in college, I really fell more, I started to fall for the idea of, of the comforts of having a project. And this is from a project where I walked around and gave people objects to look at. Still really interested in this work, but. And then 
the first time I was really inside a project that I kind of knew was a thing that, that would go into the public were these pictures called retail um, that are pictures of, of houses with reflections of little global capitalist enterprises in the window. You see them installed at the Tate Modern. I made this book, My Life in Politics, um, looking at sort of political environments um, and can see the elements are all kind of there for what's going to come down the line. Here's an, this was early, this was around 2012, correct? The My Life no, in Politics? No, it's, or, uh, the show here is 2004 and the book at the Bowen Foundation and then the, um, oh. the book came out in 2006. Okay, okay. Um, you know, sometimes it's a very wide bandwidth, right? I, I, in this work, I could kind of photograph any any way that politics kind of extruded into my daily life. And sometimes it's a very narrow bandwidth. These are a project called Permanent Collection, photographing paintings um, in, in museums, but looking at them from an angle so that um, the light changes, you know, the, the, the surface of the painting. And see here this Thomas Aikens painting. Uh, projects about light and, and this project was called Ill Illuminations. Um, about light and kind of the mis, uh, misuse of light or overdetermined use of light. And in fact, I even have an ongoing series of pictures of, of audiences. Um, and this is the, uh, my book launch at Aperture in 2006. Anyone who was at this, who's here, you know, wins a special prize. I'll personally, if anyone's in this picture and they're currently on this Zoom, I'll personally write you a poem. Um, one of the constants of all this work is I'm using a view camera. So I'm using like a large format camera with film that you schlep around and there I am in the, in the woods with it. It's a difficult machine to operate. It's, it's exhausting. Um, there's, um, and starting in about, uh, in 2017, I had started a project called Sunset Strips. And these came about because of the uh, topography of, of my local mall area, we call it the malaria, um, in Kingston, New York, which is built up on this escarpment and happens to look out over this extraordinary um, landscape that's like a Hudson River School painting. And if from the beginning, one of the kind of hallmarks of my work, I think, is, a, is that need to, um, to feel like there's both sincerity and irony or both the body and the mind or some kind of, some kind of stew. And this just seemed like, okay, if I'm interested in these kind of environments, right? Well, maybe this is a way to take a sunset picture, right? I mean, sunset pictures, everyone's taking in sunset, sunset picture and they're, they're difficult to do a good job with, right? But you see it. In fact, I often explain um, exposure by having people take a picture of the sky and then try to photograph the person down below. And you all know from your phones how difficult that can be. Um, so this seemed like to, uh, something I, I call art school gold. It was like, it had everything in it, you know? It was beautiful. It had a simple idea, which in a world of kind of like gallery art makes sense, right? You kind of want to have a show with some kind of simple thing that makes sense, that the collectors know which are the good ones, you know? And so I thought another very typical thing of a photographer, right? Um, I think of photographers as, as being like, you know, um, autistic and there's that, that Temple Grandin thing of building slaughterhouses, right? Where, where like the, the, the cows feel comforted if they're constrained as they're led to the slaughterhouse, you know? And I always feel good, like knowing what I'm doing. Um, and so uh, I thought I should make more of these, you know? Um, and I started traveling around making more of them. Um, this is in Green River, Wyoming, right? There's a Timothy O'Sullivan of the same place. Um, that looks good, you know? This looks great. But 
these pictures came with a tremendous amount of labor because I would spend the entire day climbing up, right? So the idea is they're from elevated perspectives. They're, um, you know, kind of 19th century way of seeing the landscape. Um, so in dialogue with 19th century photography, but, um, you know, with this modern landscape in the foreground. And I would spend all day like scouting the locations and then I would get nothing, right? Like the, the, the sun doesn't always set. I mean, the sun always goes down. Don't get me wrong. The sun does go down every day, but it doesn't always make a sunset, right? You have to have clouds for there to be a sunset. If it's a day with no clouds, I never should have gone to Colorado. I tried to go to Colorado, there's no clouds in Colorado. So I'd spend all day scouting this location, climbing up these weird embankments and climbing on top of buildings and trespassing. And then I'd get nothing. And it was driving me nuts. Um, it was hard. It was very hard and kind of depressing, you know. And then my wife, uh, that's my wife, the painter Lisa Sanditz who's always got a lot of good ideas and knows how to keep me happy um, and, and, and knows a little bit herself about the kind of complicated relationship between beauty and the landscape. That's one of her paintings that was painted on the side of a building in lower Manhattan by creative time. Um, she said to me, you got to do something that's going to make you happy. And I sort of thought, okay, and it, that happened to coincide with the fact that for the really the first time in my life, I was going to ha not have a job. I've had a job, you know, since I was 14, basically. Um, and I was going to L.A. on sabbatical and we arrived on Christmas Day. Um, and, you know, I sort of thought, you know, what am I going to do to make myself happy? And, and, and over the years, I've when I'm teaching, I've noticed that if you have a student that's not producing anything, the best way to get them to do it is to say, what do you like to do with your body all day? Not like, what do you care about? Or what's your favorite thing? Or what are you passionate about? What do you do with your body if nobody is asking you to do anything for an entire day? And if they say, I like to play video games, then you get them to make something about video games. Or you get them to sit on a couch and make photographs. But I, so I started to think like, well, what do I like to do with my body? And I like to wander around with a camera. All my life I've been like schlepping this enormous thing, you know, why? So I got a digital camera and I thought about this guy, William Eggleston. And I just thought, whose life do I want to have? Not all the parts of his life. I don't want to be an alcoholic. And who else? But but just the part where he's wandering around all day with a camera, a little camera, and, and it's a hand camera, photographing whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> so I got to L.A. on Christmas Day, and I went for a walk with my sister-in-law, and I I was looking through this house here in this kind of like little tout, ticky tacky little house, and I was talking about it with her, and she said the words, "I'm looking through you." And suddenly it just kind of, it was like one of those <clears throat> that instead of having a very set, set, I would have this phrase and I would just wander around with this phrase in my head all day for the next, you know, time, the entirety of my sabbatical thinking about it. And that's how we got this book, right? From there to here. So I'll just quickly sort of talk about the process. Um, the process was, I'm a guy that's like very disciplined, right? I'm, I'm, I'm used to using a view camera. I don't take a lot of pictures. I'm very careful. I don't, um, but suddenly I can take as many as I want, but I'm still very careful. I'm still very disciplined. So, um, and I had also set up a series of complications. Like I'm using a digital camera, which I've never really done. I use a little bit, but for specific projects, but never really invested in it. And I, I didn't like verticals much. And I was using this 35 millimeter aspect ratio that almost all digital cameras have, which is terrible crime against photography. But I just decided to do that 
I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to have them be verticals. Everything I don't like, everything I would advise a student to not do, I'm going to do. Like, don't do as I do as I don't do as I say, basically. And then I started making these pictures and I was wandering around and I was doing all of the uh, what I think of as like a kind of Olympic level of photo expedition. Like I'm willing to get involved with people. I'm willing to engage. I'm willing to make a portrait. I'm willing to photograph someone that doesn't know they're being photographed. I'm willing to make a significant detail. I'm willing to get down on my hands and knees. All my pants have a ripped knee because I'm always down on one knee. Um, and where did it go? It's raining. Okay, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> I don't see the icon. Um, so I'm wandering around Los Angeles. It's a great city to walk in, despite the publicity. It's a fantastic city. It's just a series of little villages that are connected by like Dante's Inferno kind of underpasses that you have to go under. But once you get there, you're in all these little villages that are beautiful with wide sparkling sidewalks. Um, and one of the things I noticed was that if I had all day to wander around and I was making plenty of pictures, so I didn't feel like anxiety about it. I had lots of time. And so I started to write songs. I'd always written songs, but I, I, I started to write them sort of in consort. And so what I have here is I can't see it. So I hope it plays, but it's like an audio clip of, of something that I took. I recorded on the day I took this picture on the left. It's raining reflectors. It's raining reflectors. It's raining reflectors. And it's all of the song. And the tall of the song. And the song of the song. On the roll with the song. And then I've got a little later on. Oops. You hear that, right? It's raining reflectors on, on Sunset Boulevard. And the sea stands, do knee bends in the dark. So um, you got time when you're not, you're not always taking a picture every minute. This is, and so I wrote some songs, so I'll, I'll play you this song. Um, do you think I should make unshare? No, I'll just get, right? Can you hear that? How's that guitar sound? That sounds great. That's really good. It's raining reflectors down on Sunset Boulevard And the sea stands to knee bends in the dark And the models suck on bottles of the finest light on earth While flashes spark Let's take a picture of a waterfall in the basement of a Korean mall Let's tell our friends Gotta take another call Producers make excuses Down on Sunset Boulevard and the clients get defiant in Van Nuys. Hair and makeup, gotta break up just to keep the smile on. You can see it in their eyes. Let's take a picture of a waterfall in the basement of a Korean mall. Let's tell our friends Gotta take another call. Ba la 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 la
take a picture of your smiling face Put a filter on it just in case A shadow of doubt should leak into your brains La 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 Can I ask a question quickly? Yeah, please. Because the, um, the the voice memos that those began as, they just, they happened, I mean, were they thinking about the photograph or did they happen in the territory where you made a photograph or just sort of like, are really in between, as you were saying, just in the wanderings? Or, um, no, they, they a, that picture, that I don't think that this, um, Um, suddenly I can't go any, okay. Um, yeah, that, um, yeah, that and, is a very, that's a very intriguing photograph. It's one of those photographs that I, I just want to kind of, the one on the left, yeah. I, it's the second image in the book, correct? Or the third, second or third? Uh, one, third, it's the third image in the book. And um, it's one of those photographs that I just kind of want to just live with and let it be what it is, but I also can't help but ask what what's going on there <laughs> what's going on is i'm watching a photo shoot and there are photo shoots at all over the la all the time right and instagram has made it so that the photo shoot is kind of the you know the basic it's like the sort of recreational activity of of huge portions of the population i've almost never done one i've like never done a photo shoot i've never photographed a model i've never used a light you know, I've just never done that. But I was watching this guy photograph this model in this crazy outfit, and he was obviously terrible at it. He was just doing it all wrong, you know? And he, he was way across the street and had this little, you know, a guy with a round reflector, you know, golden reflector. It, it was no way it was touching her. And I just was like, I'm walking across the street and making a real, a great picture. And this picture, I always called it, I win photography, which is a thing that uh, I feel like I win, you know, this crate, this model, I mean, who knows? And I get, and I'm getting her in this in-between moment that wouldn't be in a fashion shoot where she's obviously, I mean, just suffering out there in the heat and who knows what else for her art. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I just started to think about I started to think about ref those reflectors and then it just came into my head. It's raining reflectors. That was the first thing. Yeah. And that's how I write a song. All my songs usually are written by some line that then becomes the sort of rhythm of the song and the melody comes and then the words and melody and rhythm all kind of come at the same time. Um, and I just thought, oh yeah, there needs to be a song about this. There needs to be a song about, you know, a photo shoot. Um, and yeah. yeah, so that's, that's that one. Um, and you know, everywhere you go in LA, right? You see these, you see the, did you want to say something more about that picture, Sarah? No, that's, a, that's so not what I thought it was. And um, what I, did you, it's, it, what did you think it was? I, I thought it might be someone um, just kind of wandering Los Angeles in a, in a very, uh, her own way. I did not realize that she was dressed up thought that might be her style. Well, it's totally, I mean, part, why I knew I loved the picture was that there's such an intense problem with homelessness and mental health, untreated mental yeah. health, right? So that it's just, you get this thing of you kind of can't, you can't tell all the time who's a model and who's not. Right. Um, and that interested me. And, you know, it kind of leads to the idea of like, um, you know, this sense that I have in this work of a kind of like, um, what I'm calling like medieval sort of photography, like a sort of sense that people are not exactly individuals with, um, 
personal biographies, but almost like these kind of like um, saints. Mm -hmm. They're almost like this kind of um, elevated or extrapolated um, quality of like kind of intense feeling. And, um, you know, as I was photographing people, I just found myself feeling like when I was looking at the world, I wasn't looking at the world. It was like I was walking through a, a museum of medieval art, of, of weird artifice, like, and people are so great there at artifice, right? They're so good at a sense of, of themselves as a character and the, and the world as a place of full of potential. Um, I thought that was... I thought that was really interesting. I mean, you begin your essay talking about surfaces and, and how the camera is just such the perfect tool to explore surfaces. And LA has this reputation of being all about surface. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, I guess since, since the seventies or, or earlier even, and, and even, you know, the pilasters made out of plaster and um, having lived there for 20 years, I kind of, I, I see it more as just a place of sun and heat you know, and, and I, I have friends there and I got a little bit, I dug a little bit through the surface for sure, because simply from like brute force of, of time. Um, but, you know, when, when you're from, when you're not from a place, and this is something that I'm learning now, having traveled for a year, it's like, you, when you come to a new place, it's all about surface. And so many people know, so many people know Los Angeles from its reputation more than for what it is. And um, yet, I think what you've captured here is this like delirium, even though, even the people who live here, like I still feel delirious. You know, I still feel like this this city is a siren. And um, I, I wanna talk more about music. I'm kind of going out of order here because I wanted you to play more songs and talk more about the music. But I do, I do hope that we talk about like place in general. And I think it's very interesting that you're talking about the, the ability to travel through a place with a small camera as opposed to lugging around a big camera. And um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, I have a lot to unpack in that. And, and the thing that really, you know, I keep, I keep going back to, to the idea that the camera can only see the surface of things. Cameras cannot yeah. see low. And so they're very, photographers are reliant on the idea that the surface contains some kind of expression of inner life, right? The word portrait comes from a Latin word that means portrait, uh, the Latin word is portrahere, which means to draw forth, right? Like to draw forth the essence of somebody. And it's impossible, like you can't do it. It doesn't yes. work. What you're always looking at is like a, a bunch of light off of the face of somebody at one moment from one particular vantage point selected by that, right? In collaboration somehow. Um, yeah. and you know, I know that we're living in a super complicated time where, where the power dynamics of photography are being unpacked and, and explored. And it just, I've always sort of had to go like, I just don't think that I'm photographing the reality. Like it just does, it never, when I go out to photograph, I don't feel like this is just like, I've stepped out the door and it's the same as it was when I was inside. It feels like a different place, as if the, having the camera is like the, that thing of like, you know, the first shot in a movie, like you go to sit a movie, you go to a movie theater, kids, there used to be a thing called a movie theater, you went into it and there was a big screen. But that opening uh, right, of that, whatever movie it is, doesn't matter how terrible it is, that opening shot is like this massive, like you fall into a world. And if it's a boring movie, you get used to the world really quickly, right? Like, yeah, there's talking trees and whatever. Okay, I got it. If it's a great movie, you never get acclimated. You're always like, whoa. But I always feel when I'm photographing that I've done that. Like, I'm just like, oh, it's some other place. It's not real. And, mm -hmm. you know, Los Angeles, part of the reason, you know, I think I was lucky to have ended up there because it wasn't like a choice exactly, just sort of happened. Um, we have family there and it's always a place that photographers that live in the cold, dark East go to photograph. That's the reason why there's movie studios there because it's sunny all the time. The light is ecstatic. So, yeah. um, but I also just immediately felt like as a person that maybe I'm a mythologizer, right? I'm not necessarily going like, 
it's not documentary photography. It's not going like this person lives here and they have this problem and this thing happened to them. It's, I'm like mythologizing and it's a good place to mythologize. It's, it's begging for it and it wants it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, keep, keep going forward here. Maybe yeah. you can keep looking at more images. I was like driving to a friend's house with my, to the, the wonderful writer, Sarah Manguso's house, one of the, one of the great American writers. And um, I just like pulled over and I just said, like my son was there, I, just, I was like, don't move. I just left him in a, in a bus lane and ran. I had to do it. Like, here's a clown and he's okay. giving me a business card, right? Everybody's got a business card because everyone's about to make it, make yeah. it big. Um, yeah. So, you know, what you're looking at here, this isn't all 100% exactly the edit of the book. Like I've, I've, tweaked a few things a little out of order yeah, yeah. like i wanted to Not get some mention. medieval stuff oh, sorry. yeah I to yeah what, what am i doing here okay we have to talk a little bit more about the medieval the medieval yeah. concept but i i also i mean you showed us the you showed us the fic the picture of um uh, of los Feliz, the house with looking through the house right yeah. earlier but that's not in the book no, because it's not that good of a picture. I felt like it was kind of, but you have a section in the book. It's later on in this keynote, but you have a section of, of windows. Um, there's, there's kind of the, um, actually the shooting ranges. Yes. Well, there's the car. It might not be in order here. I, I could, I could I've pull it up. Screwed up the, the order a little bit by mistake, but. But it almost felt like, um, so, so in one of your essays, you talk about, you, and you sort of mentioned it earlier that the Saint Ver Veronica thing where, um, you know, yeah. she's, she's the saint who, who felt bad for Christ and sort of toweled him down and then ended up with a picture of his face on her, on her towel. And I feel like you've kind of done that with these images. Yeah. Um, the sequencing in the book, you have these kind of sections, which, which speak to either parts of your essays, um, just the kind of overall colorfulness of it, the storytelling. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that picture is just not that great. Like, you know, you can have a great idea and if you don't have a good picture, then you don't put it in the book unless you're just a concept, pure conceptualist, right? Then it doesn't matter how the picture looks. Um, so that picture with, you know, and my sister-in-law gave me this, it's not even an idea. It's just a kind of function of how to work. And, but that yeah. picture doesn't work. I mean, the thing is this picture, this book has a hundred and whatever it is, 55 pictures in it. And there's thousands more that aren't in the book, right? That, that um, yeah. if I take you to the end of this presentation right now, you, know, you can see, um, Andrew Sloat and um, <laughs> Leslie, um, I don't yeah. know what, they look like they're on their phones here, but I think they're photographing these pairs, right? So we just got like thousands of pictures and we're just, for like a years, we just kind of would meet every once in a while and start putting them together. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how, how the thing evolved as a thing. But, you know, I can't, I don't want to have a, a picture, even if it gave me the idea, if it isn't good enough, right? You don't put it on the album, right? It might've been, you know, something else that kind of got you there. Yeah. So, well, it feels like, I mean, the, 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 some of you, my, my favorite of all time projects of yours are the retail pictures where you have the reflections of say McDonald's or some other franchise in a, in a, in a home window and then the, the permanent collection works. And I think those are all kind of fall underneath this, this like umbrella of ill illuminations, correct? Yeah, I mean, that was, a, that was a specific show, but yeah. But yes, I mean, certainly about like the way light kind of does, I'm looking at, at, at things the way, not the way they're meant to be looked at. I mean, that's always yeah. been, I don't all want syntactic. to look at the right way. Yeah, the, and it, but it's, but it's like a portrait of light, 
it's 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 really and and you say you don't use light but you are always you're always like searching for it and and i'm not, not always i can't say always at all but you a, a big part of your work i think is is photographing light and and in, in los angeles so this is just this is just color which i guess is light but it's it's i mean i never saw los angeles this color colorful um it's it always felt um, kind of like if I got too far away from where I lived, everything just kind of molded into a sort of beige. I was very unhappy with a lot of the choices of colors in this city, but somehow you've, you've cut through that in a really amazing way. Yeah, I mean, it's true that LA and Southern California and the West are extremely tawny, uh, yeah. tan and a crew. I've got to. I got to have some tawny pictures in here. You can start to. This one on the right is in Bakersfield. Like I'm getting out a little bit um, from the center. I'm going on little trips and exploring, but mostly yeah. I'm foot. And yeah, I mean, uh, so it's prejudiced, right? It's not. It's not. There's a photographer I follow on Instagram, and I'm gonna forget his name right now, but I should look it up. But it's he lives in. Uh, like Modesto, Robert Angel or something. Can't remember his name. His pictures are all tawny, every one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'll remember his name in a minute. Um, going backwards here. Here's this little mini section. Now, there are little mini sections. Like I have always been interested in signage, right, from that very beginning. Um, I just spent the day with Roe Etheridge the other day and I told him, I was like, I was mad at him because I was like, you own this. You own this and there's no one can, else can do it. And I was mad at him, you know, but I love him. And you have, you have sort of, you, you take some of those signs and you put them through, you sort of put them through the books as almost section headings too. Oh yeah, like, I uh, those in here, those, those are in my presentation, but that's a, that's a nod to, um, my Life in Politics, the book, which okay, yeah. and Andrew Sloat, who's like a great artist that I know from, grad, we both went to graduate school together. Um, but those were originally just sort of like blank sections where I wanted some yeah, kind, kind of, of, you know, and then in yeah. My Life in Politics, he, he took out signage and hand redrew it. And so this was like a yeah. kind of wink that, that we're all in this together still. Um, but I don't have them in here right now. Um, Sarah, yeah. do you have other questions for me? Like at this point? Oops. Well, we're 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 getting to the point where maybe we could hear another song. And while we're while you're playing one more song, if you if you feel like you want to do that, because I bet all of us would would enjoy that. I I um we could think of um if if the if our visitors have any questions. Yeah, please put out um, some questions, everybody. Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. Um, this is not a song that's exactly contemporaneous, but it seems like it makes sense for the um, what we've been talking about. When your lightness weighs a ton And you're making Memphis come you Might be Walker Evans' son Or be William Eggleston Mix Kodachrome with rum The setting southern sun had a picture perfect pun. You get a William Eggleston. Sincerity and irony spike the virgin daiquiri that city. That's the simple 
simple recipe for all that you are meant to see. You don't have to look that far through the windshield of the car. When nostalgia gets outrun and the night has just begun. Every white man with a gun shoots like William Eggleston. I'm going to make eventually a whole show of songs about different photographers. Um, I posted a little bit of a new one called The Powerful Ladies of Platinum Palladium this morning on Instagram. That's, oh, wow. Instagram. That's about uh, yeah. Lois Connor, Kathy Opie, and Judith J. Ross. I know it's printing out paper, but it'll be in the back <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the recording when we get the big contract. Yeah. It's such a musical book. I mean, I, I, it's funny because I've told you before in our previous conversations, and I'll tell everybody here, I'm sort of a little bit musically ignorant. I love music. I listen to it all the time, but like, I don't know bands and then suddenly be like, oh, that Led Zeppelin song. And my husband's like, what? How did you know that? And, but um, so when I first even saw you promoting this book on Instagram, I, of course, was singing the, the Beatles song in my head and um and didn't even you know put two and two together but it's sort of one of those things that every time i pick it up it's it, i've got the beatles song going for like you know at least a couple of hours it's one of the and only yet, Martin songs where he's got a negative energy toward women usually has a very positive energy toward women well it's, um, it's interesting because it's it's it me. kind of but it reminds me of some of the stuff that you write about in your essays in the book because it's it's a you know you can't really write a powerful anything or take a powerful picture until something really like, you know, gets at you. Otherwise it's just going to be a pretty image or a, a beautiful song, but, which is nice too, but sorry. Well, I don't know. I mean, the thing is like, I actually think that, I don't know if I agree with that. I think amazing photographs are made totally by accident. Like lots of people, anybody can make a really good picture, especially now. I think the key though, is what you do with it. And so that's why like the, the book and why this book is such a great thing that everybody should buy is that there's a huge amount of work in it. And I think on each individual level, you're right. Like I'm super moved by everything in it. There's no doubt about it, but well, that would that would just that would be such it's such an interesting song. It doesn't even have to be about a woman. Like it's, what I'm saying is, like after the fact, if if you can't figure it out, you've gotta you've gotta have some kind of a relationship with it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. right. I think, like you know, this photograph, you write about, about this. Giant Beatles nerd. Like I know every single thing that they ever did, every minute of every day, and that's not like exactly my favorite song. And, and I tried to find ways to make it kind of relevant, but in a way also the song became a little bit vestigial like that initial photograph where, because I began to think of you, who you was. And yeah, look at it, in the end it became the camera, right? And I write this thing about the camera being a thing that like, you know, I'm not like the easiest person it, in the world, like I, I, I make trouble sometimes and like the camera loves me no matter what, like no matter what I do unconditionally, as long as I give it enough light and you charge its batteries or you put film in it or whatever, there's some errands, you gotta, you got a little bit of work to do. But if I go, Hey, today, like I want to like just wander around or today, like, you know, here I am, this is like a block from where I was living this car. And then on the right, that's like my wife calling me and going, you got to come down to the studio right now because I got outside the window, there's like a dead body in a car. Um, you know, no matter what I, what no, this guy like came out um, on a front stoop at like eight o'clock in the morning and was like, hey, you want to take my picture? You know, oh, wow. because I have a tiki bar in my apartment. Um, <laughs> Sure, you know, but no matter what I ask the camera to do, it it, it does it. Like it, it agrees with me. It says, okay, let's try it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So that's the thing. And at the end, I just became like, I'm so grateful to that camera. It's it's I'm the best me when I'm photographing. Like I'm the very best person I I am. Other things I'm like, all right, at. And we haven't really talked about the writing, but I'm also very proud of the writing in this book. And so anyone out there that wants to like read a photographic essay or an essay about art, I, I normally I don't recommend reading essays about art because most of them are very hard to read and unpleasant and full of words you don't know. But these aren't like that. They're entertaining and meant to be like personal and yeah. I recommend it too. They are they are stories. They are and they connect so they connect very nicely, you know, obviously directly to, to images in the book too. So should we do some questions? Yeah, let's do some questions. Here's one that kind of um, relates to what you're just saying. Tommy uh, says, Hi Tim, your small camera images seem to compose with perfect vertical line. Are you shooting with a tripod or handheld? They look decisive moment, but with perfect composition in terms of camera placement. I just said decisive moment. Because um, I put in this presentation the idea that for the first time in my life, I really felt like I was in a decisive moment world. Um, I put these Cartier Bresson pictures in it for precisely that moment. I mean, you don't, you shouldn't never put these pictures in your presentation because you're never. Go, gonna... Wait, go to the. Go to the image right before, though. Yeah, that one. That's, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, almost all of them are made by hand, on a hand, uh, by, in a, in, with, in, not on a tripod. Some of them are. Like, occasionally I'm in a really dark place, but I actually don't know. Like, if I went through and tried to find the ones that are made by hand, uh, on, a, on a tripod, I'm not sure I would find any. Those might have all gotten edited out. Yeah. Mm. But they are digital camera picture so you know that I'm fixing like straightening things out and you know I'm capable of that I'm not embarrassed um Philip says Tim I'd love to hear more about the walking did you plan ahead or just wander aimlessly did you impose any rules on how and where you went well, there's a couple of things. That's a great question. I, I think, again, that like the whole idea of the photo expedition is like an untheorized thing. Um, so it was kind of different all the time, but and it would depend, like if I had to pick up my son at school at a certain hour, like I would plan to get there at a certain time or I would walk all the way. Like we lived in Echo Park and he went to school in in um, Glendale. So I would like sometimes I'd be like, I got to pick him up at four o'clock. I'm just going to walk to Glendale. Um, and, um, I didn't mention the work I did in, in Rome and China, but in this book called, um, the new antiquity, which is, a uh, that was work where I was living in Rome on a Rome prize. And I just found I had nothing to say about like the ancient city. So I would take a bus out to the edge of the suburbs and just wander around out there. And I've got to the, I, I love the idea of going to the end of the bus line. So that happened too. Like I sometimes I would go to the end of a bus line and just see where it landed me. And then yeah. a wonderful thing has occurred. I'm not like one of these people that's like a tech guy, but the the fact of there being like motorized scooters and uh, Ubers and all that meant that you know the photo expedition always used to be circular. Like you had to kind of like go here and then you had to end up back at your car or you had to end up back at your house. But now you can just go and then go as far as you want out this direction and then go, I'm gonna take an Uber back here. And that was magic. That was like super great. That was like, wow, what a gift. I don't have to worry about where I end up. Um, and you know, again, like I was grew up in a world where that's what we did as kids, you know, just kind of wandered around and, and, and it was, it wasn't um, odd. And my whole coming into consciousness as a person involved little kids like doing, you know, playing in a vacant lot. And my oh God, I'm really starting to sound like an old person. <laughs> but yeah, so I love walking and anyone that's a photographer that's ever done either walking or both walking and driving knows that they're like completely different, right? So driving, you get in front of amazing things. Like you just get to these amazing things, but you miss the, the micro detail and walking, you see all these things that you never see in a car. So, uh, yeah. you know, I just, I just yeah. found that like, I was like, and, and 
you can get your exercise and make art at the same time. That's one of the things I say to people like, you know, I, I could teach like a, an exercise class, photo, photo, photo size, photo size. <laughs> oh, you're good at coming up with the photo photo words, photo, the photo glossary of Tim Davis. I like it. Um, Oh, he, Edie says, has living in LA inspired you to write more music? They're like little operettas on our quirky LA lives and brand. Mm. Well, you know, I started in, I'll play just a tiny bit of it, but it's like this, uh, like a bossa nova. My friend Joe Hagen made me this playing, this playlist for LA to wander around and listen to. I didn't really, you know, it's hard to like listen while you photograph to something, but like I wrote the song that goes, um, if you're a dog, you should end bark. It's what you do. If you're a car, you drive and park. It's what you do. If you're a tree, you sit and be, but this is new. Say, I love you. It's what you do. It's a bossa nova, you know? Um, um, and there's like, you know, there's a coolness and restraint of the, about this place. Like also for all of its showiness, it is kind of a strange, cool, not temperature, but like, you know, um, people are not as quite effusive as they are in, in Los Angeles, in, in New York, right? Where you'll just see lots of massive expressions. Like people are in a car and they've yeah. got barriers, but, but, um, so there's a coolness that I liked that kind of worked its way into the music too. Even the surface of the car, yeah. We've got a lot of surfaces to cut through in Los Angeles. I can't and say we anymore. You can. Yeah. I'm going to maintain as, I'm a visitor here, right? I am not an LA artist. I'm not a person who's been there all my life. Um, but I don't think that matters because hardly anybody has. You're true, yeah, no, it's, I mean, I know there's people on in our group here who, who grew up here. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it's well, a place. I'm, I'm happy if somebody wants to say that it's wrong or something to impose one's vision on a place, I'm happy to engage in that conversation. It is your vision. It is definitely, it's, I mean, as much as it's, as much as it's a container and this is, you know, a book is always a container and it, there's a theme and, and the sequencing is amazing and it works so well, but it's, um, it's it's your it's your Los Angeles and it was it was something that came to me I I got it in Miami and it kind of called me back to town you know but it wasn't my my it wasn't my Los Angeles <laughs> it was like it was some crazy vertical beautiful mesmer, mesmeric prismatic metaphor of Los Angeles um, let's see we have another question do we have time for more questions Emily. Yeah, we, uh, couple, yeah, right? we can take one more, one or two more. Yeah. Okay. Um, I tr uh, Christine says, I truly enjoyed the writing, laughed so hard at the can I help you bit. As a teacher, I've done whole lessons on not letting that throw you. What do you tell your students when, as you just did with Roe Etheridge, it feels like everything is already owned by somebody else? I think that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I'm like, there's a difference between, um, you know, a strip mall signage. He owns that, but like, no one can own, own portraiture, no one can own landscapes, no one can own. But, um, you know, my main feeling right now, like my, the sort of central myth of my life or the central story of my life as an artist is that the little act of like pressing a button on a camera and going like, this is art. Like, I'm gonna look at this little section of reality. I don't care if reality means like a section of your studio or with lights or a photo shoot or whatever it is, whatever it is, you're gonna go, boom, that's art. I'm gonna make art. And you're gonna select a little, a little rectangle or parallelogram of the world. And you're gonna go, this is art. And that that, action is so unbelievably mysterious still so completely bizarre and unlikely 
175 years later after the invention of photography, it's still completely strange to me that I could do it. And um, because of that, like the friction of it, right? So it's sort of a frictionless thing, right? Boom, and it's extra frictionless in a digital way. Or you haven't even paid for it, you know? You used to have to pay every time you press the button. Now you don't even pay for it. Yeah. So it's extra frictionless. But I still maintain that every time you do it, there's some kind of friction, some spark, like some energy of, of removal. And that energy, I think, is complicated. And the way that you handle that energy, the way that you go, okay, I took this thing, anybody can do it. I think anybody can make a good picture. I, I don't think it's hard to do. It's very easy, actually. And it's easy, getting easier, right? The phone does it. The best pictures in my phone are the ones that my pocket took, usually. And, but the act of it is so strange and that friction, that, that's like one thing, how you react to it, how you learn from what you did and go, I'm gonna put them in this order and I'm gonna connect them in this way. I, that's what makes you an artist. Uh, the ability to make a good one is not, doesn't make you an artist at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, this book was a huge, crazy struggle, much more difficult than anything I've ever done. And, and not suited to like my onto the next thing, ADHD kind of mind. Like it was hard and it was, and it was amazing. And to have Leslie and Andrew to kind of play against collaboratively, you know, really made the thing come out right. And lots of things happened along the way. Like I started to, I made a playlist on Spotify of all like film noir music from California film noir, like Chinatown and um, uh, LA Confidential and, and um, the conversation that's in San Francisco, but like the soundtracks and I just re-edited the whole thing listening to these film noir. And I think that if you, if you look through the book from the beginning and you think about it as a kind of like, a kind of uh, film, like a noir where sight lines are are like like this lady's like whoops she's like looking here and then she sees this and then like these things are all kind of on each other and um mm -hmm. i really thought of it in a narrative way in a way that i don't see any individual picture as very narrative in particularly but yeah um i really wanted the book to feel like a narrative and to feel like really thought through and not just like okay anybody that makes a book thinks of the order but i really wanted it to feel like something yeah one of my favorite quotes in the book is is um i mean one of, i think it's the first essay um now no i think it's the second or third second now is the nervous system of the photograph mm. and you know that sort of you have to have a system to have a nervous system and if the present is the is the is the nervous system, it's like touching all these other images in this book, in the way that you and that goes beyond sequencing. I that one. <laughs> Sorry, I don't remember writing that one, but that's a good line. It's a I good line. One of the things I think about a photographer, I personally have found that over the years, it's harder and harder for me to think about the future. And that I like, I'm so used to living in the moment and really living in the moment, not in some kind of, ooh, I, but like, I gotta make all this happen now. Like, yeah, lady is looking at a script for like a soft core porn movie. And she had, she's actually, she had gotten it and she was deciding whether or not she was gonna go into it. She was nervous. This guy's reading a script of his, I have to like get there and solve the problem and make it all work and make it the best possible thing. Oh, there's a, I've woken up in the morning and there's a book of, of, uh, Julian, uh, what's his name? The modernist photographer guy of LA, the, uh, Schulman, Julius Schulman. And there's a praying mantis on it. Like, and I've got to get my camera and all of that energy. Um, all of that is like, you know, in the now and, and actually find that it, I, I think one day there's going to be like a new England journal of medicine article. That's like, Photographers lose, lose ability to see the future. Like, like now, nowness is like some kind of disease, you know, disease. Right. The evolution of the photographer's brain. Wow. Okay. 
we're getting the signal. Do you do you want to send us out on a song? Uh, do you want to hear? Um, what should I do? Um, Someone was asking about your Spotify playlist too. I see. Yes, I think I it's called through you. I think it might be shareable. I'm not sure. I can make it yeah. shareable. So follow me. Um, do you want to hear another song? I'll play a little bit of the, the powerful ladies of Platinum Palladium. Lois lives on Gramercy Park. She's got a dark room and a kitchen. She traveled hard and she traveled far, making platinum prints so rich and tall that the lotus flowers you want come as thick as the velvet fog. If it's lotus flowers you want, then it's Lois Connor you got. She's a powerful lady of platinum palladium. Powerful lady, never, never took a silly one. Powerful lady. Powerful lady of platinum palladium. Judith took her eight by ten to the Vietnam Memorial with a frame cutting in like a razor to the Adam's apple of the tragic and fragile ones singing gravity song so young. If it's gravity song you want, then it's Judith Joy Ross you got. They're the powerful ladies of platinum palladium. Powerful ladies never took another system. That's one powerful lady, powerful lady. It goes on, it goes on, but it's worth it. For Fifty dollars, you could go to Applebee's. Uh, you know what I mean? Like buy the book and give it to your friend. It's it's fun. It's, yeah. it's good. It's so beautiful. It's a really beautiful book. It's coming. Appreciate it. Thank I'm you. Real yeah. I'm getting in here. <laughs> thank you, Tim. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you for everyone for coming. Be sure to get your copy of the book. Link in the chat. And if you are in New York or in Los Angeles, come to one of the upcoming book signings where Tim can sign it. And who doesn't love now being around people now that we can and um, hope to see you all there. So thank you again, Tim and Sarah. Thank you. Aperture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good night, everyone. Bye.